Looking to protect your cards? Whether you need sleeves, deck boxes, binders, playmats, or even backpacks, Ultimate Guard has your collection covered. Literally. Premium products offering priceless protection. Visit ultimateguard.com. Hello and welcome to another Historic Brawl gameplay video. Today we're taking a look at a 5-color Ramos Dragon Engine deck as voted on by my supporters on Patreon. The Dragon Engine's a 6-mana 4-4 flyer. says whenever we cast a spell, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Ramos for each of that spell's colors, and then we can remove 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters from it to add 2 of each color to our mana pool, but we can only activate this once each turn. So the goal of our deck is to ramp into Ramos, cast some 5 color spells to potentially put 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on Ramos at once, and then we can immediately remove those 5 counters, adding 10 mana to our mana pool, which can enable some powerful plays. So looking at our deck, I've split it up into a few different categories, starting as usual with the mana acceleration, where we have some of the usual suspects into the north with our five snow-covered basics to help us ramp on turn two already. Paradise Druid can also fix our mana. Grow Spiral puts an extra land in play. We've got some ramp artifacts, although we're not playing the ones that make colorless mana, instead just playing Arcane Signet and Cold Seal Heart. Ornithopter of Paradise is also useful. And then at 3 mana Cultivate, Chromatic Lantern can also fix our mana, which is useful in a 5 color deck. Dragon's Horde synergizes with our commander, which is a dragon, to maybe draw some extra cards. We've got Skyclave Relic, can also be kicked to make additional copies of it as an indestructible ramp artifact. Celestus can maybe give us some card selection. Then Firemind Vessel and Key to the Archive can ramp for two. The new Timeless Lotus is also pretty nice, as it can make one of each color, even though it does come into play tapped. And Gilded Lotus makes three mana for one color, and we can activate right away. And then we've got additional ramp cards that offer some extra utility as well, such as Faber Elder, a 3-mana creature that can grow up to a 5-5 with Vigilance, as it gets plus 1 plus 1 for each color among permanents we control, and then can also tap, making that much mana. We've got Kiora, which can untap our permanents, great with some of our ramp artifacts, such as our 5-mana Lotus, for instance, which we can maybe untap right away to make 5 mana, and then can also draw if a large creature enters a battlefield, so it also draws off Ramos entering. Got Uro, which can put additional lands in play, gain life, draw cards, and we can escape it from the graveyard to do it all over again when it enters the battlefield and attacks. We've got Teferi, which can also be great with our ramp artifacts, as we can untap those, maybe untap a mana creature and a land to add extra mana, but we can also use the minus two to dig for extra cards. We've got the Cultivator, which will enter and find a forest or island card and put it on the battlefield untapped. We've got Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, can draw extra cards with E plus one, and then end of turn it untaps two of our lands, so we can still maybe use that mana to cast instance during the opponent's turn, and the minus three can also give us some more removal. We've got Escape to the Wilds, which will exile the top five cards of our library, and then we can play cards exiled this way until the end of our next turn, and we can play an additional land as well, so that can also help us ramp while providing extra card advantage. Mirari's Wake will give our creatures plus one plus one, and it also doubles the mana production of our lands. We've got Golos, not running it as commander, but still very good in the 99 here, as it will find a land when it enters, usually goes to get a world tree, which will then also fix our mana going forward, and then we can activate it to provide extra card advantage. And Tomb of the Guild Pact is also great in this deck, saying whenever we cast a multicolored spell, draw a card, and taps for one mana of any color. And Chromatic Ori costs seven mana, but can tap for five mana right away, and will also fix all our mana going forward, and also rewards us for controlling permanence of various colors, as we can pay five mana, tap it, and then draw a card for each color among permanents we control, so we can potentially draw five in this deck. Then the next section is spot removal mostly, and some other sweepers as well, at one mana source to plowshares. We've got a D-Spark and Vanishing Verse in black-white. Then there's Lightning Helix to deal 3 damage and gain 3 life, and we're even playing this over Lightning Bolt itself, since we typically won't have red mana available on turn 1 anyways. And then being a multicolored spell has a few synergies throughout the deck, including a growing Ramos by 2 plus 1 counters. And then we have a few ways to deal with artifacts, which is pretty important in this format, as you can tell from all the ramp artifacts in the earlier section. We've got Prismari Command, Colagans Command, and Putrefy can all destroy artifacts. Putrefy can also deal with creatures. Colagans Command can also choose a second mode, such as maybe making the opponent discard, returning a creature from our graveyard, or dealing two damage anywhere. And Prismari Command can also make a treasure token or draw and discard. Then there's Deafening Clarion as a sweeper, dealing three damage everywhere, maybe giving our creatures a lifelink in the process. We've got a Knight of Autumn, can also blow up artifacts as well as enchantments, maybe gain four life or get two plus one counters. And then a Void Rent, an uncount 
uncounterable removal spells that can destroy any non-land permanent. Rivatier's Charm can make the opponent sacrifice their largest creature, but we can also use it for card advantage. Then there's Supreme Verdict as a 4-mana uncounterable sweeper. Binding the Old Gods we could have put in the ramp section as well, can destroy non-land permanent when it enters. And then on chapter 2 finds a forest to put on the battlefield tapped. Doesn't even have to be a basic forest, so we can even find some of our trial lands that have the forest type. Then there's Unleash the Inferno, can deal 7 damage to a creature or planeswalker, and if we deal access damage we can maybe also take out an artifact or enchantment with it. Casualties of War can choose one or more, destroy an artifact, destroy a creature, destroy an enchantment, destroy a land, destroy a planeswalker. So if we can live the dream we can take out 5 of the opponent's permanents with just one sorcery. And then a Cut to Ribbons can first deal 4 damage to a creature, and then we can replay it from the graveyard with Aftermath, making the opponent lose X life. Then in the next section we have a few creatures and other utility cards. Dovin's Veto as a 2-mana counter spell for non-creature spells. Kavu can grow up to a 5-5 pretty easily in this deck since we have all those trial lands and dual lands. And then when it attacks we can maybe discard and draw or exile a card from a graveyard. The boots can give a creature haste and hexproof, so perfect for protecting our commander. We've got a rhythm to make our creatures uncounterable. And then riot means our creatures either gain haste or enter with an extra plus one plus one counter. We've got a nickel bolas as a great four drop, a four four flyer that makes the opponent discard. And if we pay seven mana, we can transform it into the planeswalker, which can draw extra cards and also offer additional interaction. Siege rhino, just a nice four five trampler that will drain the opponent for three and gain three. And then Door to Nothingness, a fun alternate win condition, 5 mana to play it, enters the battlefield tapped, and then if we pay 2 of each color we can sacrifice it and the opponent loses the game, so that can also potentially be activated off the extra mana that Ramos provides. And then we've got some 5 color cards that if we play them with Ramos out can immediately put 5 counters on it and then make 10 mana afterwards, including the Prismatic Bridge, can also potentially play a Sika for 3 mana, and then the Prismatic Bridge can find additional creatures and planeswalkers each turn. Then there's Archangel, a 5-5 flyer that when it deals combat damage to a player lets us cast a spell from our hand without paying its mana cost, so it will still add extra counters to Ramos, which only cares about its colors. Then there's niv Reborn, 6-6 flyer that can provide extra card advantage by finding some two-color spells among the top 10 cards of our library. And then the Kami War, a 6-mana Saga, that will first exile an opposing non-land permanent, then bounces an opposing non-land permanent, makes the opponent discard, and eventually transforms into a 6-6 Flying Trampler that provides extra card advantage when it attacks, as well as increasing its power. And then we've got some more nice curve toppers here and mana sinks, including a Nickel Bolas God Pharaoh, an awesome Planeswalker that can gain card advantage even from the opponent's library. Got a Runus Ultimatum as a one-sided board wipe that deals with all the opponent's non-land permanents, including artifacts and enchantments. We've got a Genesis Ultimatum to look at the top five and put all of those permanents in play and put the rest into our hand. We've got Zakama, which will untap all our lands when we cast it. A 9-9 with Vigilance, Reach and Trample, and has a few activated abilities to deal damage to opposing creatures, take out artifacts or enchantments, as well as gain extra life. And then Hydrate Crisis provides a large flying trampler to sink all our mana into, draw cards and gain life. And Sphinx's Revelation will draw X cards and gain X life, so an even better rate than a Crisis. And then our mana base includes a ton of the tri lands. in fact we've got all 10 of them. Then we've got one of each basic, has to be a snow-covered basic to go with our Into the North. We've got all the shock lands that require two life to enter the battlefield untapped, as well as all the Innistrad dual lands that will enter the battlefield untapped later in the game. And then I've got some additional fixing here with a world tree, as we mentioned, to maybe get with Golos. Can act as a chromatic lantern as soon as we have six or more lands in play. Don't have any gods to necessarily search up besides Esika, so don't plan to activate it very often. And then a command tower, of course, and a few fetch lands with Evolving Wilds, Fabled Passage, and Expanse to get our basics. So yeah, that's our five-color Dragon Engine deck. Let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Okay, we're on the play, facing Tezzeret, Master of the Bridge, so blue-black artifacts. My hand leaves a lot to be desired, don't have any ramp, can't even cast Knight of Autumn, which admittedly could be okay in the matchup. But let's take a mulligan. This is a bit better. We can enter the north on two, get blue mana, cast Uro, start ramping. Still need some help off the top, since we're far from casting anything else. But this gives us a chance... To fetch up our snow covered forest. And get our islands. So just missing red mana now. Our 
Arcane Signet. And Evolving Wilds is nice. So play Uro. Pick up Attack Plant. So now we have every color. And we can think about what to fetch with Evolving Wilds. Probably go for a Plains here. So we'll have double white for Supreme Verdict. Okay, so six mana total. What's our plan? If I play Kiora, I can untap land. Still have four left over. Maybe cast a Supreme Verdict. And then next turn we can draw off either Ramos or niv -Mizzet. That seems fine. And this should work. Right into battle. The ocean surges, life thrives. Guardian Idol. Three mana left for Liberator. Okay. Well, Gilded Lotus is a great combo with Kiora. So I can play Lotus, tap for three. Untap it with Kiora and still play our Dragon Engine. Nature flows with vigor. And then now with the Dragon Engine in play, it's going to be easier to deploy all these multicolored spells in the same turn. Expecting Ramos to die, but we still got to draw a card off of it, so it doesn't feel too bad. And then the Mizzet will be an awesome way to refuel. Okay, Phyrexian Scriptures does not destroy artifact creatures, so Ramos is safe. No attack from a Liberator, and a Putrefy could also blow up an artifact here. But uh, step one is probably to cast niv and see what we pick up. And five mana with Ramos, although we could attack with it first. And Teferi and Mirari's Wake are both pretty good. Find the Sphinx's Revelation of our draw step. So let's see here. Can only activate Ramos's ability once each turn, but we can still play Teferi here with our floating mana. And more counters to Ramos. And then we can attack. And then still on tap, Gilded Lotus, a land, and our creature. So let's give that a try. Opponent takes 11. Okay, so step one. Probably untap Gilded Lotus, Dragon Engine, and Xander's Lounge. Then activate Ramos, add a bunch of mana, could play Mirari's Wake. Arcane Signets. And then we can still activate Kiora, so let's say we activate this for red. Untap Lotus. Can cast a Kami War. Go after the scriptures, perhaps. And then we can still putrefy, although we'd have to do it now. Which is fine, we'll just kill Liberator. Well, there was a turn. And we still have a Sphinx's Revelation left, in case we need more card draw. So we'll see our opponent's response. And I guess we can use this during the opponent's turn as well, so if they have removal we could still Revelation for a bunch. Talisman's fine. Cosmos Elixir, that's not gonna save them here. Alright, so we could attack for lethal, probably should. 
Although, if we wanted to get more value of Revelation, we can. Prismari Command also great against the Artifact deck, so opponent cannot catch any breaks. And that's game. Awesome. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Black's Vexing Pest. So, a Critter Tribal deck here. Our hand seems nice. Can start out with Fabled Passage, get maybe an Island or a Plains. Turn 2 Heart, turn 3, we could already Binding. And uh, suppose we'll get a Plains. We have some double white cards in the deck as well. Turn 1, Shepherd. And then Heart can name Blue. And that still sets up Binding next turn. Turn to Butler to start filling the graveyard. See a Meat Hook Massacre. So do we want a Binding anything? Not particularly, so we could just play a Relic for now. And our hand is shaping up nicely. The planes will make it a little harder to cast Genesis Ultimatum, but uh, not too concerned. Supreme Verdict is a draw. So I could already play Ramos, even though don't expect it to necessarily survive. Not the end of the world if our opponent kills it. And then we can wait for a more valuable target for Kami War. And if Ramos survives, great, then we can generate more mana with it. Bone Shards discarding a Beast Whisperer to take out Ramos. So that will now cost 8 mana. Take 2. Could just Binding to keep developing our mana. Take out Shepard. Don't want to kill Butler and have the opponent get back their Whisper. Okay, opponent had a safekeeping all along. And then now... Probably go for Islands to make it easier to cast Ultimatum. Search for Blacks, so opponent's not interested in the front half of the card. Instead they can pay life for card advantage. And uh, can get a Tri-Land. Let's get the Catria Triome. And then we could replay Ramos. Give that another shot before moving on. Would love to untap with it and go Kami War into maybe Genesis Ultimatum. In the graveyard, nothing too exciting besides the Beast Whisper. Opponent's got 6 mana. And the Midnight Sky to play, that's fine. So we may get to untap with Ramos. I'll take one. Alright. So step 1, Kami War. Exile Midnight Sky. And then attack first. And then we can still Genesis Ultimatum. And uh, sure, we'll put all of these in play. Or maybe keep Kavu to trigger Tome to draw cards. And our opponent has seen enough. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play facing Clothis, a god of destiny. So a red-green beatdown strategy, usually. Our hands, kind of awkward with... Not a whole lot of mana fixing, even though Kira plus Lotus is nice, I think we need to mulligan. This isn't much better, sadly. We have a lot of removal, but uh, we're not gonna get to cast much. Okay, this is probably our best hand so far. And I think we ditch Ornithopter, since our opponent may be able to kill it, and we don't want to play into our own Clarion. 
And then I'll fetch a forest here to start out. Even though we're probably not going to get to cast into the north right away. Turn 1 Kumano definitely points towards aggro, so glad to have Clarion. Next turn could play Kiora. Alright, opponent does not take advantage of the extra plus one counter at least. So yeah, Kiora. And then next turn we can maybe double spell Clarion and into the north, set up for Ramos. And uh, yeah, that can draw with uh, Kiora, hopefully find more action. Usually prefer having Ramp in my opening hand, since we're pretty likely to find some expensive cards later. Fable's a good one. So I'm happy to wipe the board with Clarion, and then into the north as well. Maybe an extra white source, although we have fountain, so I don't think it matters. So next turn, play Ramos, and then hope to top deck some more expensive cards, as we said. Fable discards Sniper Bushwhack, and Arlen, pretty good here. Can make a pair of wolf tokens. Putrefy does not answer Fable, but maybe once it transforms. So yeah, stick to the plan, can deal myself two damage. Preserve a loyalty on Kiora, although I've got a feeling Kiora's probably going to die soon anyway. So maybe we prefer hanging on to the untapped land for next turn. Let's get okay, just a land off the top. Opponent's got 5 mana. Unnatural Moonrise transforms Arlen, so that can turn into a 5-5 to pressure Kiora. And hopefully no fight spell here. Fight rigging. Arlen can go up to 6, not quite enough to enable fight rigging. And then next turn Ramos can take out Arlen at least. So it could have been worse. Alright, opponent sends both at Kiora just to make sure. Okay, we found Prismatic Bridge. That's pretty exciting since that'll put all the counters on Ramos. And then I can attack Arlen as opposed to keep it on defense. And then I could still putrefy, but that means losing a bunch of counters. Is that worth it? Reflection is kind of scary. So that may be worth taking out, or I can wait and see what opponent does. And maybe respond accordingly. Yeah, let's just be patient. If our opponent copies a wolf token, it's not the end of the world. And then hopefully we'll find some uh, nice expensive cards with Prismatic Bridge. Although there's always the chance we just hit a mana creature with it instead. Could have also considered playing a Sika, just because our creatures would have gained Vigilance, or legendary creatures. So we could have uh, capped Ramos back, but then we also wouldn't have gotten nearly as many counters. Flashback on Natural Moonrise. Okay, that happens. And then now I may want to putrefy response. Prevent the opponent from drawing cards. And then hope that Prismatic Bridge carries us. Alright. Cow is not bad, but uh, Hydroid Crisis is a real winner here. So how much mana are we working with? 
Well, probably easier to just count manually. X equals six. Two more counters on Ramos. And some nice draws. Can attack for eight. And then we've got plenty of removal at the ready. Samuits can deal damage or give a creature a double strike. Dumri's Ambush does not quite kill the Krasis, but allows for an attack for 10. Yeah, I think we can take 10. And then with Helix and Riveteer's Charm, we can clean up the opponent's board. Find a Teferi, that's nice. And our opponent explodes, since Teferi can tap Reflection and we can attack for lethal. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing old stick fingers, so it could be a reanimator combo deck, or it could be a fair graveyard strategy. Either way, our hand seems keepable. We have some early accelerants, and then Teferi could also interact with a minus three where needed. For now, play a tap to Blood Crypt. And then Archangel could be fun too, as a way to maybe cheat some cards into play for free. Turn to Paradise Root. Next turn we can play Kiora and Ornithopter. Timeless Lotus also exciting with Kiora. So play this. And then I'll just untap a land, play Ornithopter. Don't want to try and untap Paradise Root and have our opponent kill it in response. Okay, so nice start for us. Next turn I could play Lotus, untap it, still play Archangel. Opponent has the cultivation. So, could see Stick Fingers here for two, putting some expensive creatures in the graveyard to next turn reanimate. And there it is. Shieldred and Vorinclex, both quite powerful. Although we might be able to beat them if our opponent reanimates them, so... Stick to the plan, Lotus, untap with Kiora, play Archangel, and draw with Kiora to hit our land drop, beautiful. So if our opponent goes for Vorinclex, we still have Archangel to help with our uh, mana situation here. And Shieldred we can also answer with Teferi. And uh, sacrifice an Ornithopter here. Void Rend, another answer. Okay, so what's our move? I can maybe play Ramos first. And then Archangel puts the Fairy in play for free. Take it from there. Draw of Kiora. Haruna's Ultimatum's fun too. Archangel attacks. And uh, yeah, free Runus Ultimatum sounds fun. And uh, let's see here, untap Lotus, play to Fairy. That can draw. Play Signet, keep up Void Rents, and pass a turn. Okay, we're ready to answer whatever opponent reanimates next. So we probably got lucky that our opponent didn't find Cultivator Colossus to put in play instead, since that might have been able to put a ton of lands in play for free. And our opponent explodes. Awesome, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Jadar, Ghoul Caller of Nefalia, so Black Sacrifice deck. Our hand does have an Arcane Signet, but overall probably has too many expensive cards. This also needs a bit of help. If we find green mana for Elder, we might be off to the races. 
but once again a lot of expensive cards in hand I'm gonna go down to six and this is much better so cannot cast the Riveteer's Charm at the moment so that can go and then we can uh, maybe get our green mana going in case we find some early ramp cards and then turn for either Vessel or now Key to the Archive Prismari commands we could cast to take out Jadar. I guess we'll set a stop here and then we'll reevaluate. Diabolic Intent to tutor up something. Not sure what that could be. But now I'm down to maybe kill Jadar. Frexian Tower can make two mana. So I guess we'll let our opponent go to combats, and then before the end step we want to kill Jadar, or maybe in the middle of combat. So two damage, and then maybe go for a treasure token, since I'm pretty happy with my hand, although we could draw to discard too. Yeah, the treasure might be more helpful. Yeah, I kind of wanted to kill Jadar in the middle of combat, so they weren't able to make use of the two mana necessarily. Now they potentially still can play a Xander's Wake. And uh, we'll just play a key to the Archive. And Putrefy deals with artifacts, not enchantments. Maybe a Day of Judgment is what we need as a reset button. And then cuts going to the graveyard is still good value. Dark Rituals, maybe what they searched up. Arcane Signets. And Black Market Connections, so another powerful enchantment. So, could play Dragon Engine. Don't expect it to survive, and we're going to be one mana short of Dovin's Veto for protection. So I think that can wait. And then for now, play Vessel, keep up Veto. Opponent goes for all three modes on connections. And a painful quandary. That seems worth countering. Okay, so do I play Dragon Engine? I'll be a little short of casting a Nicol Bolas afterwards. But uh, it seems fine. And then if our opponent takes out... Ramos, then uh, they might have more creatures in play that we want a Day of Judgment, and then we can play Nicol Bolas. They once again choose all three modes, down to 13. So if they don't kill Ramos, we can potentially deal quite a bit of damage with it next turn. We have a Ribbons in the graveyard as well. So we can already Ribbons for 8. But Baleful Mastery exiles Ramos. So that goes back to the command zone. But now our plan of Day of Judgment looks better. Alright, Bojuka Bog exiles Ribbons. That's a pretty big setback. Since that was part of our game plan. So let's clean the board and play Nicol Bolas. And then I'm thinking I keep Rafine's Tower in hand. Since we don't have much action left. Opponent discards Specimen, which they can easily get back. So don't love our spots. Opponent's pulling pretty far ahead with his connections. Shambling Ghast, that's fine. Opportunist for more card draw. So sacrifice to Frexian Tower, trigger Xander's Wake, make a treasure, draw a card. Opponent still has five mana available. And a Spider Queen to get in front of Nicol Bolas. 
Although we can potentially still transform it. Awakener, that's fine. And a Timeless Lotus to draw. So it's 7 mana to transform Bolas. So that does not leave enough mana for Lotus. We can plus 2 up to 9 loyalty. Although our opponent could still kill it next turn. Taking out Spider Queen doesn't seem particularly exciting. Maybe I start by drawing with Rafine's Tower, see what we pick up. And then I can still play a Lotus. Okay, play Lotus. And then... Probably still hang on to Xander's Lounge. No attacks. The next turn I can maybe transform and draw, and still have some mana left over. Opponent settles at 6 life to make a treasure. Down to 5 with Spider Queen. And a Murderous Rider down to 3 to kill Nicol Bolas. Well, we could top deck a few burn spells now. Opponent attacks. Okay, let's cycle lounge. And the rhythm into Ramos could do it. And we have just enough mana here. Haste. <laughs> and our opponent explodes. Yeah, unexpected hasty Ramos to win a game we had no business winning. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Kodama of the West Tree, so opponent's going to present some early creatures with plus one counters that we need to keep in check, and we can do so with Lightning Helix, potentially Vanishing Verse later, so I'll try it. And then hopefully pick up some more ramp cards to get a Lotus in play a little bit sooner. And yeah, we can just play a tap land for now. Not in a hurry to Lightning Helix. Can't wait until Kodama shows up. And I could play a Tapped Fountain. Keep up Lightning Helix and Vanishing Verse. Opponent with Fortification, putting counter on Pack Leader. So if our opponent plays Kodama, I think we just kill Kodama instead of Pack Leader, although both are an option. Just make the commander more expensive. And then Verse can maybe deal with a larger creature later. Okay. Next turn, could play Teferi. Could play Lotus and maybe ramp into Ramos first. Scythe Cat plus a land. So I think we'll take three. And then next turn we can play Teferi, untap two lands and still have Vanishing Verse available. And then we can decide whether or not we want a Vanishing Verse Kodama if they replay it or one of the creatures in play. Right on Hurry. And then Prismatic Bridge could be fun. Opponent is just going to go after Teferi. If they have a protection spell that could be awkward. But let's try and save Teferi. Okay, still up to loyalty. And Vivian, not a bad play. Grows pack leader. And can take out Teferi with a minus. So that was a setback. Alright, put on pluses instead. They could have taken out Teferi with a minus three. Now we get to keep Teferi for another turn. Plus. You know what? And what's next? If we play Dragon Engine, it just dies to Vivian's minus. So, playing Gilded Lotus to ramp into Zakama is tempting. Could also play Prismatic Bridge, but that could also find a mana creature. So, Lotus is probably the safest move, and then we can still play Key to the Archive afterwards. So, that's quite efficient. And then Putrefy, 
probably our best pick. Can get rid of a Triome. So don't quite have the mana to putrefy here, unfortunately. But next turn, we can slam down Zakama. And at least in Historic Brawl, we don't need to worry about uh, minus five getting any creatures since there's no sideboards available. We're fit enough to survive. Okay, so if we play Zakama, we want to make sure to float mana from our lands first. And then you can still maybe activate Zakama a few times. So we can deal 3 damage to creatures, so we cannot damage Planeswalkers. Could also keep the ability available to respond to maybe a fight, or Vivian putting plus 1 counter somewhere. So we don't necessarily need to act right now. And uh, should be able to play Celestis as well and still have 2 activations left over. Which I think I prefer over playing Prismatic Bridge. Grafted Growth, that's fine. Plus one count from Kodama. 6-6. Six, six. And then Vivian to distribute two counters. So it could activate Sakama twice in response to deal three damage twice to Kodama, take it out. Although, of course, our opponent still has some mana untapped here. So maybe the safer move is to just putrefy Kodama and take it from there. But our opponent packs it in. All right, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing the Night Witch. So black-green sacrifice deck. Our hand's okay. Even though we don't get to play our two-drop on curve. Have Signet and Ornithopter for a bit of ramp. And our opponent puts in Bojuka Bog. Right, now we can play a turn to... Maybe Arcane Signet, although Ornithopter may be better since we're not taking full advantage of Signet tapping for mana the same turn we played it. Crucible to replay lands from the graveyard, makes sense. And then now, could play a Siege Rhino, could play Signet plus Kavu, and start ramping towards our commander. And then Fabled Passage can get the last land type, which is Island, to grow Kavu. There's Babali Saga. Don't have an answer at the ready. Prismari Command helps can take out Crucible and Kami. So let's say we attack with Kavu. This card, a land maybe. Find Vessel. Opponent takes five. And then Prismari commands. Destroy artifacts, deal two damage. Just want to make it harder for the opponent's commander to activate. And then next turn, try and play Dragon Engine. And Dockside Chef, another cheap enchantment slash creature. So that's enough to enable their commander. And a Perilous Vault can clean up the board next turn. So that's not great. I would love to go Kiora into Siege Rhino, but in the face of Perilous Vault that seems pretty rough. So maybe we can draw an answer with Kavu, discarding and drawing. And then what don't I need? Vessel is a good way to develop our mana post Parallels Vault. So maybe Siege Rhino goes, despite being a nice combo with Kiora. 
Okay, Ruinous Ultimatum could deal with Perilous Vaults. Although we don't quite have the mana to cast it. The basic island doesn't do us any favors. Yeah, I guess we'll play Dragon Engine. Alright, opponent goes for a Great Henge, so they're probably not planning to use Vault anytime soon. We'll take four. And then now Runus Ultimatum's looking a little bit better. So I'm still not quite able to cast everything. But uh can play a Vessel. And then uh, that would set up Ultimatum next turn. And then in the meantime, Kavu can discard and draw. Probably want to develop my lands as opposed to rely too much on other no land permanents. So let's attack. And then I may just discard Kiora here. Find a land. And I'll play Vessel. Hope our opponent doesn't pull the trigger on Perilous Vault next turn. And then we can just wipe their board. Get to untap. Okay, Pearl's Vault can be used at instant speed, so that's probably what they're setting up. So I can attack first. Do I want to discard and draw? Pretty happy with my hand, so I guess we'll exile a card from Graveyard and get rid of Crucible. Opponent gets rid of Ramos, okay. So they don't have the mana to use Perilous Vault anymore. So now we can Runus Ultimatum. Opponent does get to activate their commander in response. Question is whether we can Teferi first. Teferi untaps a land, Ornithopter, and Vessel. Could also tap down their commander to kind of force a reaction. So yeah, we have to tap very carefully, but I think it works. So untap Vessel. Tap their commander, untap a land. And now Ruinous Ultimatum, and our opponent's unable to get any more value. Village Rites, I guess, still draws two. But now we get rid of Perilous Vault, which was a thorn in our side. Okay, opponent's at eight. They've got an empty board, and the fairy can generate quite a bit of mana. Although Baleful Mastery will take it out, still draws a card on the way out. A Lotus Cobra plus land means they can replay their commander. So I could attack. See if they block, and then if they don't, I could still Supreme Verdict if I'd like. Or I can just replay my commander to threaten lethal. And we'll discard Farmland and draw. Uro's nice. Should be able to escape it as well. And our opponent jumps with Cobra. Fair enough. Don't think I need to Supreme Verdict. Let's just play Uro. And uh, I'll hang on to Evolving Wilds. And then we can still escape Uro. Okay, that should be good enough. I'll keep land in hand to discard to Kavu. Wistrider can present a few extra blockers. And Titania does have Argoth, so opponent could actually 
melt next turn. Knight of Autumn doesn't have anything to destroy. This is a time for Dragon Engine. Probably. And then we can still discard Evolving Wilds after attacking with Uro and Kavu. Might see our opponent jump and sacrifice a bunch of stuff. And uh, sure, I'll put a Hallowed Fountain in play. Double chump. Okay, so I can play Ramos and then still maybe Void Rend their commander. Although right now it's not the biggest concern since they only have the two card types. So, yeah, let's just play Ramos and pass. Not overextend into a board wipe necessarily. If our opponent escapes Woe Strider, that should be fine. Still only creature and land to sacrifice. A Blood Artist, okay. I guess we'll kill Titania response to clear the extra blocker. And prevent uh, extra life drain. Opponent can scry. So we've got seven in the air. Can make it two more with Knight of Autumn. Cultivates is one more counter. So play Knights with uh, two plus one counters. The secret mode cultivates. And then I can discard the land I search up with uh, Kavu as well. And attack. So their opponents might be able to survive, but they'll lose their entire board in the process. Alright, so we got to see our five-color Dragon Engine deck in action, and it's a pretty fun deck once it gets going. Get the early ramp online is pretty important, so sometimes you have to mulligan aggressively to find those early accelerants, and make sure you have the right mana to cast your spells, and then hopefully top deck some nice five-color spells to play with Ramos in play, and to reap the rewards. So that's going to do it for today's gameplay. want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.